Good day, Lakeshore Church family. And to those people who are watching right now, I hope and pray that during these challenging times, during this pandemic, you're okay, you're all right. Suddenly, we realize that life is so fragile, life is so essential. And I'm sure so many scientists and researchers have been looking for a vaccine to save lives. I have a challenging topic for today. The topic is about cost of discipleship. I thank our pastors, the church board, for allowing me to preach for today. And this topic is also pertains about saving lives. We have a vaccine. We have an answer to save lives. Our main scriptures can be found in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 38. I'll be reading it for you. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, this is Jesus speaking, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone's ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes in His Father's glory with the holy angels. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for your word for today. Thank you for this opportunity to Listen to your words, O oh God. We ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us, O oh God, to open our spiritual ears, our spiritual eyes, even our spiritual hearts, O oh God, and mine, O oh God, to understand your message, to accept your message, and apply this in our daily lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have two main questions for you. Two main questions. The first one, what do you do for living? What do you do for living? It's rather a very easy question to answer. Some of you may say, well, I am a teacher, I am a nurse, I'm a doctor, I am a plumber, I'm an electrician. That's what I do for a living. Probably some of us are still establishing our career in life. Later on, you're going to have this career for your living. The second question is what are you living for what are you living for that's kind of a bit harder question than the first one usually there's a moment of pause to answer the question probably some of you may say well i'm doing it for my own self. I'm living for my own family, for my own loved ones. Probably I'm doing it for my career, for my ambition, 
I want to get wealthy and buy big houses and cars. That's what I do for a living. That's why, that's what I am living for. To further answer this second question, let's take a look of the whole chapter of Mark 8. Let's take a trip back to the place called Caesarea Philippi. This is a different Caesarea to mention in the other books of the Bible. Caesarea Philippi is a Roman city located in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. There's a huge rock cliff that dominates the landscape of that place. At the base of that cliff, there's like a stream of water running all the way to the Jordan River. Imagine Jesus was there talking to the big crowds, really big crowds. And this is a very critical moment for Jesus. At that time, so many people were following him because of his teaching, because he performed so many miracles. He performed so many healings at that time. And people that time heard his teachings and his miracles. But some people though, like those rich people and powerful people, even some religious people like those Pharisees, were against his teaching. In verse 1 to 13 of Mark 8, Jesus fed about 4,000 people. That's a big crowd. And people were listening to Jesus for, for three days. And Jesus had a compassion on them. Because for three days, they have not been uh, eating any food. So Jesus asked for seven loaves of bread and some fish and multiplied it in order to feed those 7,000 people. In some other books, according to some Bible scholars, this 4,000 people only pertains to men, not to women, not even to children. So assuming you have four in the family, so four times 4,000 people, that's about 16,000 people listening to Jesus. That's a big crowd, just like a size of a big crowd uh, watching uh, an NBA games like Toronto Raptors in Air Canada Center, it's now called Scotiabank Center in Toronto. The pool capacity of that arena is about 20,000 people. I'm not sure about if you watch Maple Leafs, I don't know if that's gonna be about 16,000 or more or less depending if you are a fan of Toronto Maple Leafs. Then, after Jesus' teaching at that time to that big crowd, Jesus sent them home with some leftover bread with them. Then later on, the disciples found out that they had only one loaf of bread. And some of the disciples were complaining about this oh, no, no more bread left over for their next uh, ministry. Then Jesus rebuked them. It seems like the disciples did not really understand the situation about this physical food. Jesus can multiply foods, can provide foods whenever we need. 
And Jesus also mentioned another bread. They call it yeast or the living bread of the Pharisees and King Herod. He warned about that kind of bread. The living bread in the New Testament symbolizes the evil influence of sin. This also symbolizes the character and the behavior of the Pharisees. This also symbolizes the corruption in the high government under King Herod. Be, he is warning about this kind of food or yeast. Then later on, Jesus healed a blind man in Bethsaida by just touching the eyes of that blind man and spit on those eyes. Instantly, Jesus healed that blind man. Knowing all this, knowing all his popularity, knowing all the enemies were against him, and knowing the people also, the common people were behind him. Knowing in the later days, he'll be crucified on the cross and died on the cross day. Knowing all this, he gathered all his disciples in a quiet place. And he asked the question like this, who do people say I am? Then the disciples said, well, some people say you are the John the Baptist or the Elijah or one of the prophets. Then he asked again directly this time to his disciples. He asked, who do you say I am? And Peter declared that you are the Christ, meaning you are the Messiah, you are the Savior. Now Jesus was able to get con confession from his disciples out of this. But he wanted something deeper. He wanted a deeper commitment from them, from his disciples. Probably he may ask, now that you know who I am, now that you know that I am the Messiah, are you willing to commit your life to me? It's probably the questions. That's why he said in verse 34 of Mark 8, he said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It's like saying, well, if you want to be the true disciple, this is what you're going to do. Deny yourself. Deny yourself. That's kind of hard command on us. Even in other book, in the book of Luke, and in Matthew, he even said there that in order to be a true disciple, you must hate your mother, your father, your children, even your wife, and even hate yourself. It seems like God is a jealous God. He wants to be the number one priority in our lives. That's what he wants. He wants to love him first and then love our own family. Then he take further about this kind of commitment that he has been asking for. He nice self and he said, take up his cross. Wow taking up his cross. What happened in the cross? There were sufferings, there were persecutions. Even Jesus died 
on the cross. And Jesus wants to do that too. For us to do it, take up our cross. When you say take up your cross, you'll suffer also. You'll get persecution by believing in Jesus, by sharing the gospel of Jesus. In the Philippines, when you say take up your cross, especially during the Holy Week, during Good Friday, the devoted Catholic physically carry their cross, let other people nail them physically. That's why that tradition every good year, so many tourists around the world were going into that place in the Philippines just to see the actual nailing of the cross. But, we'll, but we, we should never do that. But we should suffer as well or have persecutions. There are two kinds of sufferings, though. There are two causes of that. One, maybe you'll suffer in your life if you abuse your physical self. Maybe you smoke, or you drink a lot, or you ate a lot of unwanted foods. You're going to suffer in the end. But this suffering that Jesus is telling us is because you love Jesus, because you love spreading the gospel of Jesus, you'll suffer. So many Christians happen to them. So many Christians, especially in China, in North Korea, even in Saudi Arabia, where I went to and ministered there, there were lots of persecutions there going on. Almost got imprisoned for sharing the gospel in Saudi Arabia. That's really the commitment that Jesus is asking us. And then Jesus further went and asked for this kind of commitment. In the following verse, he said, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and the gospel will save it. What do you mean by that? You want to save your life? And Jesus is telling, you're going to lose it for me, for Jesus, for the gospel, so that in the end, you'll save it. What Jesus is telling us, don't try to save your life by yourself. God will save your life. Jesus will save your life. There you go. There is the vaccine that we've been looking for to save our lives in the end, in eternity, in spirituality. All of us will die physically, but some of us may die spiritually, and some of us may live spiritually. You know, being a true disciple is just like building a tower. You have to make plans. You have to make sure that you have all the resources that you need in order to finish the tower. If you don't finish it, people are going to laugh at you. I remember uh, as a mining engineer, as a mining estimator, I really, you know, be, before we submit a big uh, project, that was like about $300 million project, I forgot to budget for about 700000 for uh, an equipment to complete that project. It was good that I was able to uh, find that deficiency before we submit that bid. If that one happened and the bid went through and we got the project, we're going to be sad. 
gonna lose business out of it. And one more thing that Jesus is telling us is don't be ashamed in sharing the gospel. Because he said in the end, Jesus will deny you. Regarding the death of Jesus, someone may ask this kind of weird question. The question is, was Jesus a failure? Was Jesus a failure regarding the death of Jesus? To answer this question in terms of the life of Jesus is consider his resume, consider his career. Jesus was born in an obscure village in the little town of Bethlehem. He never even went to college, nor even any professional training. He never had any bank account. He owned no property except some clothes on his back. He never had any public office except being an ordinary carpenter at that time. He never even had any family, wife, or children. His closest friends were all those blue-collar workers workers. He felt at home among the outcasts of the society, those with the poor, with the needy, even with those people who were committing sins. Sometimes that's why his enemies uh, made uh, an accusation to him that he is concerting with the, with the evil because he, is, he, he likes to be with the with the uh, people who are committing sins. So he may be able to minister to them. Along the way, he made powerful enemies by exposing corruptions in the government under King Herod. And finally, his adversaries captured him, tried him in a kangaroo court, and put him into death. Now, the question is, was Jesus a failure? In the world perspective, I can honestly say he was a failure. But consider this, after more than 2,000 years, his words are remembered and repeated around the world. His followers, numbers in billions can be found in every corner of the earth. His personal integrity stands on solids amidst the attacks of the cynics and the sneers of the ignorant. His death, which seems to be a tragedy, has become by means by which we can be reconciled with God. His whole mission on earth, which seems to be a failure, has now become history's greatest success story. Is Jesus a failure? The answer is obvious. He's not. He is a very successful man of God. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 to 11, he said, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is because Jesus died for our sins. God exalted him to the very highest position in the universe. The message is simple. If you try to save your life, in the end, you will lose it. If you lose your life to Jesus, 
in the end, you'll save it. Next question. Is your life a career or a mission? Is your life a career or a mission? Career is something you choose for yourself. That's a career. A mission is something chosen for you by someone else. That's a mission. Career cannot be found in the Bible, but mission can be found in the Bible. I'm not saying that believers should not have any career. No, that's what we do for a living. We are all, uh, we need to survive here on earth. But we should not be so career minded. Now, if you are career minded, you may break all the significance relationship in one place and move across, say, from country to another in order to go to the top of the company, maybe become a CEO or, or a general manager of a company. Your career is answer to the question, what do you do for a living? Your mission is answer to the questions, what are you living for? Your career takes you to the top. Your mission leads you to the cross. It's nice to have a career, but it's far better to be on a mission for God. Let's put it this way. This can be God's job's description for you. If you, are, if you are an electrician or maybe a doctor, you can be like you are a missionary, cleverly disguised an electrician or as a doctor. You are a missionary, cleverly disguised as a clerk, as an engineer, as an attorney. Nice to have a career, but it's far better to be on a mission for God. Next question. Is it hard to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus? Is it hard? Of course it's hard if you rely on your own strength, if you rely on your own wisdom and your own knowledge and ability. That's hard. But you can do it. Like other missionaries, like other Christians were able to do it, to deny themselves and follow Jesus. You can do that. You can do that by the grace of God alone. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he said, For it is by grace that you have been Save through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is a gift of God. You can do this to be a true disciple by asking the power of the Holy Spirit, by taking God's strength, taking God's power, so that you may be able to be a true disciple of God. In Philippians 4.13, I can do all things in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 38, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. All our challenges, all our battles in life, all our problems in life belongs to the Lord, not to ours. Do you have a career? Or are you on a mission for God? Do you have a career? Or, or are you on a mission for God? The answer to that question makes all the difference in the world. <coughs> Again, I want to repeat these two main questions. 
What do you do for a living? That's an easier question to answer. But what are you living for? That's a harder question. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, thank you for your word for today. Father God, you have asked so many hard questions in our lives. Help us to understand your questions, O oh God. Help us to understand your command. Help us to be a true disciple of you, O oh God. We ask for your grace. We ask for your power, Holy Spirit, to overcome all our challenges in our life, even our sufferings in our life. Lord, we are praying for the people who still do not know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, we encourage them to open their hearts, open their spirit, O oh Lord. Lord, we encourage them to, to ask forgiveness to you, O oh God, so that they may be able to accept you as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, for my brothers and sisters, O oh God, in Christ, we ask that you guide them, O oh God. Guide them to be a true disciple of you, O oh God. Thank you for the Spirit. Thank you for your Word. Thank you for the promise of saving our lives in the end. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.